Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I've got something really exciting for you. I've teamed up with Patrick Boyle, who hosts the Patrick Boyle on Finance YouTube channel, which is one of the best on YouTube. If you're looking for interesting videos on finance with an element of humor sprinkled all the way through it, then Patrick's channel is the one for you. And in today's video, Patrick and I are going to talk through some recent events that have happened in the world of finance that you'll hopefully find interesting, informative, and thought-provoking. So we'd start off by talking about Elon Musk, who, in my view, is having a complete midlife crisis at the moment. I know he's 52, so he's probably technically too old for a midlife crisis. But the things that he's doing currently with his business interests do seem to be a little bit strange. And I saw your recent video talking about the interview that he gave, which just seemed absolutely incredible, that he was talking about, he was talking to advertisers, telling them to not advertise on his channel, you know, to not use X, formerly known as Twitter, which if I was the chief executive of that business, you've got to be pulling your hair out at that stage. I mean, what, what, what do you think? What, what's going through his mind when he's saying well, these things? Well, it's a funny thing. Like, the question, you know, he seems to behave as if he wants it to be profitable. And to a certain extent, he needs cash flows because, uh, we, you know, we, I think he borrowed $13 billion at something like an 11.75% interest rate. So he's got to pay a billion and a half in um, interest on that loan. And on top of that, he got other people to invest, you know, so... When you get other people to invest, they want a return on their investment. And I would argue that, you know, th there's a lot of people and they go, oh, well, it's not about the money. It's about a free speech platform. And it's like, well, I'm not really sure that the Internet like there's loads of places, there's 4chan and all of these places like there's there's not really stuff that you can't post on the Internet. There's just stuff that you can't post on the Internet next to adverts, you know. And so if you wanted just a free speech platform, you didn't have to pay 45 billion for the 46 and a half after transaction costs and everything for Twitter and then turn it into 4chan. You could have bought 4chan or just, you know, set up your own website. Like the, the thing people got angry with me in the comments of the video because they said, oh, you don't care about free speech or oh, you hate Elon. And it's like, well, no, it's just that. This, this doesn't make sense. Like either if you want to sell advertising next to something, you know, sell it next to something nice. And if you want to kind of have a, you know, a website that uh, that doesn't have advertising, you can post the worst stuff on the Internet because it's free speech. Do that, but don't pay forty six and a half billion dollars and borrow money and get people to invest and then say, oh, I can't sell ads and blame the people who don't want to buy your ads. <laughs> it is. It does seem insane. I mean, I do think it was an embarrassment factor because, he, you know, he claims it was, it was his comment was misconstrued, that it was taken out of context in terms of the claims about anti being anti-Semitic. And, yeah. and I feel that he came out and, he, and he's overly, you know, he's trying to pull that back and saying it's not about advertising and, you know, I, I don't care about any of these things. But in terms of a, you know, as a business decision, it seems insane. You know, he's torching yeah. that business. It's well, just... it's an interesting idea. Like, firstly, like, you know, I, I don't necessarily think he's anti-Semitic. Like, the, the problem actually is that when you are the owner of and running a, a site like that, and even when you're sort of a big celebrity like he is, you probably have to be a bit more careful, like, you know, there's a version of the world where you could see a tweet and think it's awfully funny, like someone posts a joke and you hit the retweet button and it turns out that that person is a an absolute monster and you just didn't know. And, you know, that could happen to anyone. But the, the problem with that is that if you're if you're the owner runner of that platform, it, it's it's it's. It, it's a mess like you're, you're you've you've stepped in a in a mess um how do you deal with that like it's it's funny because before he bought twitter there were a lot of people and they argued that you know jack dorsey doesn't even tweet very much and the board of directors sort of tweet every you know six months or a year like they're disengaged and uh, you know, at the time, that was a good argument where you go, yeah, you know, it is a bit weird to own and run a platform that you don't even use or know anything about. But then on reflection, when you see um, the owner of the platform sort of making mistakes like this, because he seems to tweet an awful lot. 30,000 totally... tweets he claims to have made. 
Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I you know, not blaming him. We, we can't like it sort of becomes a bit funny if you say he's definitely anti-Semitic because he responded to a thing. And then, you know, we, we have to think about context and whatever else. It's not it's not even about that. It's that it's a bad business decision. If you're running a platform, it's kind of like um, if you have any sort of major role of leadership you kind of have to be a little bit more careful about what you say. And I know that he's wealthy enough to maybe get away with um, not being liked and sort of who cares. But he also does seem to care about being liked, you know, like he seems to put some effort into that. Yeah, so. that part, so you, can, you can see that in that interview. You know, he's looking to the crowd for confirmation and, you know, that he, he wants that sort of praise from people. But I, I think it's interesting his role that, if I'm an investor into a company, I want my chief executive to be 100% focused on making my, that business a success. And we've got a guy here that's chief executive of Tesla, which is you know one of the biggest companies in in its field, chief executive of SpaceX, which you know is, is trying to go to Mars and do lots of great things in space. He's also dabbling in X and a variety of other businesses that well, he's also seen his Tesla. his uh, storm drain company, you know. Um... Uh, what's it called? The boring, boring company, the hyperloop and all of that. You know, like I I think the problem is that he's focused too much on microblogging and not enough on vacuum trains that, uh, you know, move super fast underground because it's always cheaper to build below ground than above ground, as moles will tell you. Uh, so so is it is it possible that all of his companies can have the valuations that they've got? Because they all seem to have really high value. Maybe not X formerly knows Twitter anymore um, because we don't have a market value of that being privately owned. But you know, you've got you've got Tesla, which is still you know worth billions. And at some point, surely somebody has to pull him up and say, "How can you be chief executive of this business whilst you're doing a myriad of other things?" You know, because he's spreading himself so thinly. Well, a, a thing that made me laugh was one of the comments on, on my recent video ab about this topic was someone, you know, I, I just pointed out that the cash flows associated with Twitter are no longer sufficient to meet the, the needs of paying off that bond. So he kind of either needs to put more money in or, or the company is at risk of bankruptcy. But... A funny thing was someone commented underneath my video and said, you're an idiot. There's loads of businesses that lose way more money than Twitter does, and they're all really valuable. Uh, well, well, I think I think that's a good point in terms of valuations, and particularly for hot, hot businesses. So um, I know another video that you posted recently was on AI, uh, OpenAI, which is a company that owns ChatGPT. And, and that is rumored to have a valuation of $86 billion and is loss making. And it, and it really raises the question as to, you know, how valuable can artificial intelligence actually be? You know, I know everybody loves chat GPT because students everywhere don't have to do any work. They can all get their essays done. You know, it, it's a it's a phenomenon. But in terms of monetizing that and actually converting it into cash flow and profit, which then gives you a genuine valuation rather than a mythical valuation. I mean, how many of these AI businesses do you think can actually go full term and, and is OpenAI one of them? Well, the thing that's interesting is that there have been claims that people have built computers smarter than humans. Uh, the first one I really found, I made a video about this going back to the 1950s, where the military said they had developed this uh, this. Uh, chip that that could make human-like decisions and you know everyone got really excited about it and of course it turned out to be a computer from the 1950s that didn't do very much you know and the question is you know the, i think because of this idea of the turing test like people have come to the idea that if something can sort of bang out a few sentences that appear to make sense and that could trick an average person that, that it, it is a human brain, you know, that it's the equivalent of a person. And there's even all of this stuff like where people are kind of talking about the dangers of AI. And I mean, at the moment, the AIs that we have to be most afraid of are kind of, you know, writing bad music and, uh, you know, sort of uh, playing around with uh, copyrighted photographs and that kind of thing. Like it's, you know, I, I think that there are, 
quite good productivity tools coming out. But it's not obvious to me that a lot of this AI stuff is a whole lot more valuable than other business tools like Microsoft Excel. Like if if tomorrow there was no um, Microsoft Excel, businesses around the world would be in real trouble. While if chatbots disappeared, you know, it's it's not such a panic, you know. So and and at least, you know, with Microsoft Excel, it's a piece of software that you can sell or license to people. It's not obvious to me how much people would pay for this because it even goes back to the early days of the internet. You know, like there's a version of the world where if you were a company that came up with, uh, you know, a good email software that you could sell subscriptions to your email. But instead, what ended up happening is that email is free. You know, there's there's 50 competitors and they they basically collect data and they bang some ads into your emails and that's that's how it pays for itself. So um, as to whether we'll see sort of huge revenues coming out of this stuff, at the moment it appears that they're very expensive to run and, and that there's not really any revenue model associated with them. And, and I'm not entirely convinced that they're as amazing as people say they are. Like a played around with them enough and you kind of, you know, there, there's some obvious flaws. And now, of course, over time, these flaws will disappear. The people will work around, they'll improve them. But in terms of like, is it a business that you would want to own with your own money? Like rather than owning shares in a thing, would you want to own the whole company with no means of selling the company, but just the means of, of, you know, you have to pay for all of the negative cash flows for development and then receive the cash flows when it becomes profitable. It's not obvious to me that they are such amazing business models from that perspective. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I, I think it's interesting when you get a time like this, when it's difficult to raise capital and a lot of companies are struggling, it seems that the market wants to find that sort of silver bullet something that's going to be the next big thing that's going to really revolutionize the world and become, you know, the new Google or Facebook or whatever it might be. And AI seems to be in that bracket at the moment that investors have it as the hot topic. But you have yeah. to think that the majority of companies who are working on it probably won't see it through to the, you know, the final stages and that most of them will fall by the wayside and you know, well, because that's money. how everything goes. Like, if you look at the early days of the automobile, like there were thousands of car companies in the United States, and then it consolidated down to kind of three big ones, you know, with a bunch of brands. But uh, additionally, you know, you go back and look at the dot-com bubble. There were all sorts of businesses which at the time looked amazing and they looked like they might dominate a space. And the majority of them, you know, they were negative cash flow businesses. And when there was a downturn in the market, people sort of said, "I'm, you know, pets.com, I've got my pets.com sock puppet up there. You know, people, people weren't excited about keeping that money losing business going. Yeah, well, I think that's a good point you made about the cars in the US because I was looking today that uh, you know, we've got we've still got Rivian, the electric truck manufacturer, has still got a valuation of eighteen billion dollars. You know, and that business is is you know struggling to to make thousands of vehicles. You know, it's, it's it so seems small. To, the one thing I would say is that. All those Amazon vans that I see around are all Rivians, you know. So, and I think Jeff Bezos is an investor in Rivian. So yeah. maybe, you know, may, maybe just selling those work vans. The, the other thing, though, I read about a week ago, I think Consumer Reports came out with the most and least reliable vehicles you could buy. And I think the Rivian truck is the least reliable vehicle you can buy. And that's a bit of a problem, you know, like because because the one of the big stories that people have been telling you for years is that electric vehicles are sort of, you know, they, they don't require oil changes or, you know, uh, various filters or whatever to be changed like a, a combustion engine does. And so they're lower maintenance, but they don't seem to be like anyone I know who owns basically any of the electric vehicles has all sorts of problems with them and the problems are expensive to repair well I, I think you know one of the big issues is at the moment because it's relatively small the pool of electric vehicles you know the infrastructure is just about coping there's enough charging ports for people to be able to park on the street and charge their vehicle while you know they go to the shops but as soon as we hit that tipping point when we get to the point where 30 40 50 percent of the population owns these things we're going to have a huge shortage 
You know, in well, Europe, at wherever... the moment, though, you've got to remember as well, they're largely owned by sort of wealthy people at the moment, because I, I put up a video on the topic of, uh, you know, there not being enough uh, commodities for the electrification that that is uh, we're being told is on its way. And people said to me, like, what do you mean charging stations? Everyone charges their car in their garage at home. And it's like, well, the masses of population live in places like New York City and London, where you don't have a big garage where you park your, you know, your EV and plug it into the mains. You know, like I, I, I speak to it. A lot of the Uber drivers in London are now driving EVs and you speak to them and they don't live centrally. And it's it's a bit of a nightmare for them to go around charging it. And they're sort of plugging in at those lampposts where you're only allowed to plug in for so long and where it's a slow charger. And they tell me that it is difficult to you drive the car during the day and you plug it in overnight. You know, best of luck getting a half charge before you're out again. So and it's, I'm, I'm sure there are people at the moment who can bypass the charging systems that are in place. That, that's got to be the next development in terms of the, the criminal world. That if you've got a lamppost on every corner that's got power that can charge your vehicle, somebody's going to work out how to do that without paying for it. Guarantee that. Yeah. And then we'll throw the whole infrastructure up in the air because, you know, these companies won't be able to keep investing. And it, we've got in, in the UK, they recently pushed back the date for when everybody has to move to electric vehicles by another five years. So hmm. I think it's a realisation that the reality of it is going to be much more difficult to implement than, as well, you well, say, even the, the, question nice is, the question is even how green is this stuff? Because it's all been pushed forward with this idea that it's really good for the environment. But... It, it, it's probably, you know, these cars are probably slightly better for the environment than than running a, a petrol engine car, or at least an efficient petrol engine car. But when you look at the the cost that goes into it, like if the, the, the size of the subsidies, like the amount of money Joe Biden is spending in the United States on, uh, what, oh, I forget what it's called, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act or the Green New Deal, which is what it really is, um, you know, the amount of money being spent on that, it doesn't really move the needle as much as you'd be way better off just banging in a few nuclear power stations or something like that that would actually move the needle. And instead, you're subsidizing people to buy these sort of questionably environmentally friendly products, which it's not obvious to me. Actually, there was a very funny, it wasn't meant to be funny, but I watched a YouTube video a while ago where it was about a guy who restores old Teslas. I mean, the things are 10 years old, you know? <laughs> He's restoring the Teslas. Like, the they're kind of like, look at ago. this, it's the old <laughs> sportster. And, <laughs> you know, he's worked out a way of putting a new battery in it. And it's like, it's a 10-year-old car. Like, mo uh, most cars on the road are older than uh, that. <laughs> unbelievable. Now, you mentioned before that Jeff Bezos was an investor into Rivian and through the Amazon link. Um, mm. and, and it's interesting, I was looking... One of the other companies that he was an investor into that was meant to revolutionize the world is a company called Convoy, which was billed as being the, the Uber of trucking, that you could book a truck and, you know, it'd come and it, they'd always be filled. Um, and that, that company had a valuation at its peak at 3.8 billion uh, around about a year ago. It's now in the process of being wound down and they're, they're closing the thing down. And, and actually, Bill Gates was another investor in that company. So it tells you that these guys don't always get it right. You know, it's, it's very difficult to know what the future brings. But interestingly, I think on valuations, we're seeing a lot of companies being devalued at the moment. Many of them who raised money in 21 and 22, really struggling with those follow-on rounds. And we're seeing a lot of unicorns disappearing. They were quite a rare breed anyway, but they're becoming more and more rare over the, you know, and It'd be interesting but I mean, to see as they before. should be, like one of the biggest unicorns was WeWork, once again, the Uber of office. You know, all of those, the Uber of companies, and everyone got excited about them. They forgot that Uber is hemorrhaging money <laughs> as well, you know, or I think it's profitable now. But if you look at the money that went in versus the money that comes out, you know, we're down on the Uber. So the Uber of everything else is just... Uh, 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 a sort of a derivative of a, a questionable idea. Exactly. You've got your benchmark as a company that's not doing very well. Uh, it doesn't bode well for anyone else. But I think I think valuations are a problem. Um, but I see that in the world of Bitcoin and crypto, 
The valuations are at an all time, well, high for the last 18 months. Bitcoin hit 42,000 earlier today based on the latest uh, data coming out in the States. Where do you think that's going to go over, over the next sort of six to 12 months? You know, I slightly don't care. Like, I, I must admit that I have no interest in, well, I find crypto interesting in that it provides like kind of interesting little experiments to look at where like a person tries a thing and you kind of go, oh, it's a little bit interesting. But would I put my money into it? Like, no, um, because it's just money someone made up, you know. And uh, actually, I had a, a rather funny one. I, I interviewed a while ago Zeke Fox, the uh, the guy who wrote a, a book. I think it's a bestseller now called uh, Number Go Up. And it, it was he kind of investigated a lot of the world of crypto. But you know, one of the big claims that people make about Bitcoin is there's only so many of them. I forget how it's like 21 million or something like that, Bitcoins that will ever exist. And Zeke pointed out to me that there's lots of things similar. And he pointed out that that um, VHS tapes of, uh, of the Toy Story uh, Pixar video, the 21 million of those were made. And not only that, a lot of people will have thrown them in the bin by now. And so... It's as reasonable to base a future monetary system on VHS tapes of Toy Story as maybe Bitcoin. Uh, I think I think that is a fantastic way to wrap things up for today. Wise words. Thank you very much for your time, and hopefully we'll do this again soon.